Can you heal from abuse? What do I do after leaving my narcissist? What does a healthy relationship look like? These concerns cross the minds of over 20 people every minute, over 28,800 people every day. And the sad fact is, we still don't talk about it enough. Healing from emotional abuse isn't a band-aid situation, but it doesn't have to take years either. The lives of millions of other survivors around the world have been impacted by their narcissist. Yours doesn't have to. To show you how to live a free, confident, and peaceful life, your host and founder of the Healing from Emotional Abuse philosophy, Marissa F. Cohen. Welcome back to Breaking Through Our Silence, the podcast. Today, I wanted to focus on a way to heal. A lot of people over the last couple years have told me about roller derby, but I have admittedly never tried it. So I brought on an expert today, my amazing friend, Lauren, who is a roller derby expert and also a screaming activist. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren. Thank you. So... Would you mind speaking your truth to us, telling us um, a little bit about what you experienced and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, It's been a long, tough, uh, but really rewarding um, journey. Um, So I grew up in a really small, small, small community just outside of um, Windsor, Ontario. Um, You know, like I was a pretty average, normal kid, um, other than like being a twin, which is kind of super cool. So I grew up and um, one thing about me was I was always like a super awkward individual. So like I always say like I was like an awkward kid. I grew up into an awkward teen and now like I'm an awkward adult. But when I hit, I remember like grade eight, I remember really um, like wanting to date because a lot of my friends were um, and being an awkward individual is really hard, obviously, for me to interact with like people I wanted to date. So I hit high school uh, grade nine, whatever, I had, you know, like, fling boyfriends like you do in, like, high school, you know, you date a week, and then you break up because it's high school, but I remember when I was, like, 16 or 17, and it's weird, like, I, like, vividly remember the day. I used to run a lot when I was a teenager. Not so much now, uh, but I try, um, but I would do, like, 7k, 8k, which is, like, insane, but I was, gearing up to go do a run and uh, I remember starting turning left off of my parents street Uh, it was summer or fall and I was wearing like my favorite four years strong sweater uh, like black compression pants and running shoes I just put on my favorite podcast to run to and when my best friends uh, called me and said you know like I have this friend that really wants to meet you he thinks you're really cute and I was like oh, that's really cool. She said, like, he's older. I remember feeling really excited because, like, I was 16. And, like, when you're 16 and somebody older notices you, you're super excited. So I did my run, and then I ran home, and she's like, we'll meet up next week. And I said, okay. So she came. A week went by. She came. She picked me up in her car, and we went off to Windsor. And I'd never really, mm, I'd never really, like, really got out of like my small town other than like my parents like dropping me off for roller derby practice and like picking me up so this was like a big deal to me like I got to go to like the big city out of my small little suburb and we I remember arriving like an apartment building we climbed two flights of stairs and we walked into apartment building and it literally felt like the chaos has was erupting in this tiny apartment. Various amounts of people. I like looked in the bathroom. There's some guy shaving his head into mohawk, and I was like, "That's wild." But she brought me into a bedroom and like introduced me to like this boy sitting on a bed. He seemed really shy. And like over the course of like the night, me and this boy got to know each other, and um, we had planned to hang out uh, the next week, the following week. So we did that. It was convenient because my friend who had introduced us lived in my small, tiny suburb and would come and grab me and we would go to his apartment because her partner also lived with him. So everything seemed pretty ideal, pretty normal to me. Um, You know, me and this person got to know each other over the course of several weeks. You know, we share our truths, our dreams, our, like, fears. I don't really remember, like, when it all got sour, but... I remember my friend picking me up one day and having like a really, I'd say like strange conversation in the car about like uh, something along the lines of like losing your virginity. And I was like, what the, f-? you know, and I was like, okay. And then like, I was just like looking out the window and being like, I'm done with that conversation. 
so she dropped me off and something like was off when we got to the apartment because there's like nobody there and there's always parties going on at like his apartment which was like normal and I'd become like normalized to it so it was like this is weird it's quiet there's nobody here what the fuck's going on um so my friend was like oh like I'll see you later I have some errands to run I was like I didn't think anything of it and I was like okay the person, my abuser, asked me to go for a walk, and I said, sure, like, let's go walk by the river, because you live by uh, the river in Windsor, and I remember seeing rain clouds, so we headed back to the apartment. When we got back there, it literally just started, like, downpouring, and um, he was like, do you want to go, like, watch a movie in my room? And I was like, yeah, sure, like, that's not out of the ordinary. So I remember, like, going into his room, and I remember, like, specifically things getting... <laughs> hot and heavy and mean being like I don't think this is what I want right now but him continuing uh regardless of me trying to put in some form of boundaries and then I remember like you know like things happening that I didn't necessarily want to and me being like okay like I feel really weird after this and like my friend driving me home and I was just like I don't know what just happened, but, like, it definitely wasn't something that I wanted. But I didn't necessarily have the language for, like, assault or rape or, like, sexualized violence because I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic grade school, and then uh, I was attending a Catholic high school, and there wasn't much of a sexual health or, like, a sexual education program in my school, as you can imagine, like, Catholic schools don't very much, like, sexual education. Um, so I was, like, I don't have the language. I don't know what just happened, which was, like, awful. And so, like, I couldn't talk about it because I was, like, I know I feel really fucked up. I can't tell my parents because, like, I don't know why I feel fucked up. But I remember, like, going home and, like, getting home, like, late. And my mom being, like, how are you? And, like, me being, like, oh, I just got to go shower. And so, like, I tried to just, like, shower off the feeling that I was feeling and, like, I remember just like sitting in my bed and me trying, I was trying to come to terms with what happened, trying to put, you know, language to what I just experienced, but I like couldn't. So, you know, we continued to date and it continued to go downhill. Eventually he became really verbally abusive. He tried to like isolate me from people I cared about. The sexualized violence continued on multiple occasions, but like I didn't talk to anybody about it because I didn't know like what, it sounds not silly, but it's because I didn't have the language for it. I was like, I don't know what is happening, but like, I know it's wrong. All this was happening kind of pseudo behind closed doors. And I was, I started to act out, you know, at home and my parents didn't know like what was going on. So I, I think they chalked it up to maybe teen angst. Eventually I graduated high school, which is great. And like, I tried my, my shot at college. I went to hair school, but I was in the midst of an abusive relationship. So like I was dealing with that and dealing with the repercussions and like mental repercussions and the physical repercussions. So my parents were like, yeah, we still don't know what's going on. I was kind of pseudo flunking out of college. I was put on like academic probation because like I couldn't focus in school because I couldn't complete the tasks because of the abuse I was like facing from this person. So my mom took me to the doctors and my doctor was like, you probably have mild ADHD. And I was like, yeah, that's probably it. That's definitely <laughs> it. That's so it. Yeah. But it wasn't. It was like PTSD. And I was, she's like, okay, I'll write you a prescription for, you know, Wellbutrin, which is not something I needed. So I just like zombied out in college because I was like, I have ADHD. That is what this is. Um, but yeah. Like it wasn't. So I continued to kind of, my behavioral continued to spiral. My parents were like, we don't know like what to do anymore because like it was just me and my mom were fighting like physically, like screaming at each other, like because she was trying to figure out what's going on and like I didn't know what to tell her and like it was just not a great situation. So eventually my parents were like, we can't do this anymore. I got home one day and like all my stuff was packed up on the porch and I think at this point, me and my abuser had, like, parted ways, which was, like, great. But, like, I was still, like, really just fucked up from everything that I had faced, everything that I had dealt with. So my parents were like, you need to leave. And I was like, yep, okay. Keep in mind, like, the night they kicked me out, <laughs> um, I had met my 
current partner and we had decided that like I was gonna like shave my head into a mohawk and I came home with like a giant like put up full out mohawk my parents were like no like you have to go and I was like okay maybe not the best choice in hairstyles uh so I packed up my I called my friend my friend came and got me a couch top for a little bit with friends um eventually settled with one of the people that I'd played derby with for a really long time. And, you know, she was like, something is really weird. Something's going on with you. Were you sexually assaulted? And I just remember crying on her couch because I was like, holy shit, like, that's what happened. That's what happened to me like over a year ago. And I didn't have the language and I didn't know how to tell anybody, holy fuck, you have it. So we called a sexual assault crisis hotline. I booked an appointment with my counselor and she said, I think you need to tell your parents. And I said, you know, I think that's a really good idea. So we had my parents over and I told them. And from like my perspective, like my parents, I said like, you know, like this has happened to me. Like I was sexually assaulted by my ex-partner and that is why I was like acting so weird. And they're like, and I said, you know, like I'm getting help. And they said like, good for you. For years, I was like, it haunted me because I was like, that's not the reaction I really wanted. But what I didn't know is they left and like my dad, who's like this like white cisgender boomer who like doesn't cry very like masculine masculine man just like bald the whole way home which is like a half an hour drive for where I was staying and I was like oh so my parents took time to process that um and my current partner came with me to like my therapy sessions roller derby really helped me kind of get through everything that I was going through from the time that the abuse started to the time it stopped it was a safe haven where I could use consensual violence to like navigate abuse I was feeling on the outside world and like a really safe queer femme based space which I think was really important for me to have and I think roller derby is a huge reason why I'm still here because I had an outlet I had a safe outlet to use my body and to use consensual violence to navigate the violence that I was facing outside of the flat track. So through Derby, I actually got into activism, which was really cool. So I started to go to Take Back the Night. And I remember one day just like thinking like, you know, like, fuck it. Um, And I wrote um, something along the lines of like, me too. I'm a sexual assault survivor. And um, that was like the first time I was like publicly open about what had happened. And I remember like survivors coming to me and talking to me about their experience. And I was like, whoa, like this happens to other people. This is nuts. From there, you know, like I was healing with therapy. I was healing with Derby, which I had the whole time. I actually like came up publicly. I applied to university. I got into a gender studies program as well as social justice program. And I actually started to share my story like within like gender studied spaces because one of the subjects we talked about was sexualized violence. And like, that was like the first time I was like open in like a university setting to be like, yeah, man, like I was sexually assaulted. I started to do a lot of activism within like sexualized violence and like queer spaces and like woman based spaces and really just and really started to be open about like my story. And I found like survivors were like flocking to me and like, this is my story. This is my experience. I found a really good therapist that has like helped me navigate the residual physical trauma, even like years after therapy. I'm still obviously like not a hundred percent. When my partner first met, met me, it was a shell of a human being. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying. I would not be able to be touched. I would, <sighs> there's so many, so much stuff I had, like I had baggage, but I've been really lucky to meet a really, really, really supportive partner uh, through and through this to and he's there to like be there and support me to help like navigate my trauma to be like a support. He's been really great. I find like activism has really helped me like share my story and be able to like engage and like use something so negative that has happened to me and turn it into this fire that drives me to scream and shout my story until like I can't shout anymore because I know that there's survivors out there who are still in the closet, who are still facing abuse. It's connected me with so many amazing, amazing folks, both allies and both survivors and experiencers of sexual violence. Yeah, and that's where I'm at today, I guess. 
thank you so much for sharing all of that. First of all, I just want to commend you and say that your story is so empowering and your strength and your passion is really like you can hear it in your voice. And I'm so happy that even though horrible things happened to you, you found your way and you had all of these things in place to help you. And when you found them, you just blossomed and like flourished. I'm so happy that you shared it with us and that you are where you are today and that you're active and empowering and advocating for other people. So thank you for all of your work. I want to go back just for a second because I've heard so many good things about roller derby and admittedly Mm -hmm. I've never tried it. I would love to talk about that a little bit and like dive into how that helped you. So I actually found roller derby when I was like prior to my abuse. So I found roller derby probably just before I met my abuser. Um, But it is such an empowering space. It is empowering because it is centered around uh, like women and queer folks and femme identifying people. And a lot of sports aren't dominated by these types of bodies, by trans folk, by queer folk, by femme people, by women. Um, And it uses... I find it gives women, queer folk, trans folk, people who don't fit into like binaries, who don't fit into normalized sports, it gives them an opportunity and a space to use consensual violence as a means of like working through shit. You get to like hit your friends and skate and it's the most amazing sport I've ever been a part of. You can hit your friends and also skate. I love that. Thank you. (laughs) That's really cool. And I don't think there are enough sports and activities for the LGBTQA plus community women to really be empowered. You know, I'm actively against softball because I personally think that here's a big yellow ball that's not even much softer, but we're going to throw it underhand at your face and you can run instead of baseball. I was always a baseball player until I wasn't, until they said, well, you're a girl, so you have to play softball. So I love the idea of taking that women and, and people, all people are human and have this need to be active. And I think that that's really cool. Whereas something like boxing, which is usually a picture of a guy, you know, a big bodybuilder guy punching another big bodybuilder guy in the face, where we need that outlet too. And although I don't really condone violence as like a form of healing, I think that this sounds really cool because it's active and it's it's a team sport, right? It's not individual. Yeah, it is a team sport. It is, my derby team is like my family. Like they are through and through like amazing people. That's awesome. So through that, you found strength and empowerment and support, right? Mm-hmm. That kind of prompted you to be more vocal about what you were going through because you realized you weren't alone and you were supported. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of funny, like derby always, I've always found like derby and activism kind of like cross paths a lot of time. And through derby, yeah, like I was being, I was like, yeah, maybe I'm not alone. And like, I found activism and I was like, no, I'm definitely not alone. Um, Yeah. (laughs) What made me reach out to you about speaking with us today was a post you put on Facebook. Um, Yeah. It was an awesome poster of you. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was? Yeah, that was actually the night I was talking about. So that's my first ever poster that I made coming out as like a sexualized violence survivor. I had made a poster for Take Back the Night. And I was like, oh man, you know, like, fuck it. Like, there's got to be other people out there too. So I made a my body, my choice, but underneath it, I put like hashtag me too, or sexual assault survivor or something like that. It was cool. It was a picture of a female body. And it was yeah. pointing to you while you were holding the sign that said, I'm a survivor or I'm a sexual violence survivor. And I was so, like, I saw that picture and I was so excited because that was so empowering and uplifting. And you made something that is so dark in your life. You made yourself extremely vulnerable, but in a very empowering way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I decided that I wasn't going to let my abuser or the abuse control my narrative or control my life, I was going to take it back. In what other ways have you been active in supporting or advocating for survivors or like activities on campuses and stuff? Oh man, 
Oh, so we did something really, really cool on my campus this year. Um, I really spearheaded the event. We're going to be having it every year, a uh, skate night for survivors. So one of my friends actually owns a skate company and they supply rental skates to a roller rink here in uh, London, Ontario. Their skates are very portable, so they're able to bring them to campus. And I worked in tandem with the sexual education coordinator on my campus. And we put on a free skate night where survivors could come lace up skates. And like, it was like a roller disco. We played music and they could skate around. I, through my nonprofit within your reach, would love to partner with you next year. If you want to do something together, I think that would be incredible. That'd be amazing. Okay, awesome. So we'll talk more about that, not on the podcast. But, yeah. But I think that that's such a cool idea. So now you're taking something that helped you and that you're very passionate about, and you're like extending a hand to help uplift survivors, other survivors. That's incredible. Thank you. You're welcome. I would love if you could give maybe like one or two pieces of advice to other survivors who are still feeling the way you felt where you didn't know the language and you were really lost and confused and like couldn't put a word on it because that is so common. Even outside of Catholic school, the public schools, at least where I grew up, weren't great at talking about unsafe sexual practices outside of you could get pregnant and die like mean girls. If you have, you will get (laughs) clinical and die. Like that's what we got. And so a lot of people feel the same way you felt. So what pieces of advice would you give to those people to help them understand uh, that what they're going through is unfortunately common and help them out of that? Just know that like you're not alone, that like survivors, experiencers, and like victims of like sexualized violence walk among you. Like the person next to you could be a survivor. Just know that I know it's really difficult right now to see that you're not alone, but you are not alone. It's okay to reach out and it's okay to like ask for help and find people that you trust and tell them if you can like express yourself. If something isn't okay to you, if it doesn't feel okay, then it's probably not okay. Just trust your gut instinct. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren. I am so excited to have had you on here. I'm excited for everything that you're doing and for our future partnership. I am so honored that you chose to speak with us today. Thank you so, so much for helping survivors in the ways that you are. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. If you enjoyed this podcast, you have to check out www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. That's www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. Marissa would love to develop a made for you healing plan to heal from emotional abuse. She does all the work and you just show up. Stop feeling stuck, alone, and hurt and live a free, confident, and peaceful life. Don't forget to subscribe to the Healing from Emotional Abuse podcast and follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash Marissa F. Cohen and Instagram at marissa.fay.cohen. We'd love to see you there.